Now, um, software define E1. Yeah. So, um, as I already introduced a bit, well, E1 here on TDM is good old ISDN technology, where uh, signals arrived reliably and in time and synchronously, and uh, we didn't have lost packets or reordering or jitter or anything like that. Um, and those interfaces are 2 megabit or 1.54 megabit in case of T1 synchronous full duplex interfaces. And they're not much used anymore in telephony since everybody has this uh, interesting tendency to move to SIP. Um, uh, since apparently the quality of ISDN was way too high, uh, we had to move to something that uh, loses uh, the guaranteed quality at least. Um, However, it's still used today quite a bit in 2G, 3G cellular networks, even in 2018. So many people don't know this or assume that this is uh, gone, but in reality it's not. So where is E1, T1 used in GSM or 2G, 3G networks? Well, basically, traditionally everywhere. So uh, ABIS was over E1 using LabDM as a layer 2. A interface was either over E1 using MTP. Uh, ISAP uh, between the MSCs uh, is over E1. Uh, then, of course, the MAP protocol stack is uh, over MTP, over E1. Um, and also the GB interface from the PCU to the SGSN was either over E1 using Frame Relay as a layer 2. And uh, then IUB uh, uh, over inverse ATM multiplex was also spoken over uh, four bundled uh, E1 interfaces to the RNC. So we have uh, E1 everywhere. Um, in classic GSM architecture. And today, on the ABIS side, uh, not so much anymore. Uh, it's uh, much on the decline uh, because, of course, uh, you have an existing 2G side, you put a 3G or 4G cell at the same side, and then you put an uh, Ethernet backhaul there uh, for your LTE backhaul, and then you don't want to have E1 and Ethernet at the same side because that's double the, the, uh, the line and infrastructure cost and so on. Um, but lots of BTSs, interestingly, still have physical E1. Not just old equipment from the 90s that basically nobody runs anymore in at least uh, developed countries, um, but still um, you have even, if I, what I showed you, even uh, Ericsson uh, 2G equipment from a few years ago still only had E1 as a backhaul option. Um, and uh, then basically uh, you have this equipment that you need to uh, uh, convert and that's where this SIU, the site integration, comes into place. So you basically have an E1 link of one meter or half a meter between two units at your BTS and then you have IP. So uh, that's basically what, what ABIS or E1 looks like. On the A interface, it's also uh, very much on the decline. Um, we see this from the kind of requests we get from operators. Uh, I don't even remember how many years ago we last received a request from anyone who would be interested in having a physical E1 interface for A in, in, in the Osmocom stack. Um, so uh, uh, 3GPP has introduced A over IP uh, quite some years ago as an official standard of how to speak the A interface over IP, and that's basically what the modern MSCs implement. Uh, so if you have a Huawei or Ericsson or whatever MSC today, it implements an A over IP interface. And Osmo BSC now supports this, so um, we can basically interoperate, and there were some posts on the mailing list, you may have seen that some people completely independent of Osmocom developer community have basically taken Osmo BSC and uh, uh, established interop tests with a Huawei MSC, and it appears to work to some extent at least. Um, we haven't received any serious uh, bug reports or so. Now, in the core network, it looks a bit different. There's actually quite a lot of E1 and T1 still in, in core network. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, lots of legacy switches out there. Uh, not everyone has moved to soft switches, and as well for STPs. Basically, um, we receive a lot of questions about Osmo STP in recent years uh, because uh, people want to move to virtualized environments and they can get a soft MSC and they can get everything basically implemented in software, but the STPs uh, are proprietary hardware uh, from the vendors and some of them are no longer supported these days, so there's, there's E1 lines uh, around there. Um, and uh, um, also, I know that uh, at least, uh, I think like two years ago or so, still new MVNOs uh, in Germany would be attached over real E1 interfaces with the MNOs and not over SIG trend links or something like that. So 
it's still uh, very common uh, even for modern virtual operators that they don't use virtual E1 links or something like that. No, they use real physical TDM E1 links to interoperate um, on those interfaces. So there it's quite uh, prevalent still. Now in uh, uh, the LibOSMO Avis, we always had this interface for MISDN and DADI, as we just mentioned. Uh, you get PCI and PCIe cards, which are still surprisingly expensive. So if you buy even the Chinese clones of Digi Digium cards are rather expensive, and original Digium cards are ridiculously expensive, which is maybe fine if you need one or two of them in your, in your core network, but it's not so fine if you need a hundred of them in your radio access network uh, to attach all the BTSs. And then, of course, the PCI card, you need a rather large computer. Uh, the smallest we could find is something like the Circus uh, devices that have one or two PCI or PCIe slots, but even they are rather expensive and it's actually not really needed. Um, and if you look at what this E1 interface looks like, you have your magnetics, you have then uh, um, uh, a line interface unit, then you have some TDM controller, which attaches over a parallel bus to some bus bridge and the bus bridge goes to PCI or PCIe. That's basically how your typical E1 card looks like. And this uh, TDM controller, how I called it, of course, it's not just the TDM controller, but it even does things like line equalization. It has elastic buffers for jitter compensation. It has CRC handling, framing, HDLC uh, processors that do the, the HDLC bit stuffing and so on and the synchronization in there. And um, well, now we know there are all these uh, traditional BTSs out there, whether it's the Ericsson uh, RBS 6000 or other devices, which we could use at a low price, but we don't have a low cost and uh, easy to use E1 interface. Um, right, uh, because the, in the end, the E1 card and the PC are more expensive than your uh, BTS, and I think that something is wrong uh, in that situation. So you want something like an Ethernet or a, a USB interface between that E1 adapter and your um, your uh, your Osmo BSC, and um, that can be used with a laptop if you're doing development or under debugging something. That can be used with a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone or a, a, a whatever Orange Pi or a uh, um, whatever the names of all these uh, embedded boards are these days. Um, you just attach that and you have your one interface and then you have a really low cost like a sub $100 solution for running uh, such a BTS uh, together with a BSC or together with a media gateway um, on uh, that board. Um, so how do you go about this? Normally you would say, well, okay, let's just use one of those chips here, uh, like the line interface unit and a particular TDM controller um, and put them on a custom board. Um, uh, the problem is many of those controllers are already end of life for many years, so the very popular um, uh, Infineon um, uh, FALC or Quad FALC chips uh, that you find uh, on many devices, they are EOL for many years because ISDN is not so popular anymore. And then they have arcane bus interfaces like parallel uh, Intel or Motorola bus like it's 1980s. Um, and they're rather expensive, uh, and rather expensive means easily 30, 40 euros a, a unit uh, for a chip that basically does nothing uh, in, in terms of processing or, or logic capacity or something like that. And then they come in very arcane packages and uh, like, I don't know, 200 or more pin uh, uh, TQFP packages, like uh, six or seven centimeter long uh, uh, chip uh, um, packages, uh, really, really old. And uh, so the plan is to establish a software-defined uh, TDM or software-defined E1, where we simply use a line interface unit, which is uh, this uh, guy here in the middle, which does nothing else but converting this HDB3, this uh, ternary um, uh, polarity neutral signal uh, that uh, you speak on the E1 line to a serial bit stream on the other side. It doesn't do anything else but converting the HDB3 to uh, normal binary uh, bits. And then we go into some microcontroller of uh, whatever nature, and then uh, we go over USB or Ethernet into a Linux system. And the idea is that in here, you basically do nothing in the microcontroller. You just take bi uh, buffers of bits and you stuff them over USB or Ethernet and vice versa. And you do all the logic like the HDLC controllers and so on in, in software. And you don't bother with link equalization or whatever on, on the physical layer because, well, we're talking about one meter of copper between the BTS and, and the E1 card. It's not about 100 meters or whatever uh, where you actually have to worry about uh, reflections and, and uh, whatever uh, crosstalk and, and all these things. 
So what kind of options do we have? Option number A is uh, Dita's preferred method, uh, is uh, using a PRU. Um, that basically, uh, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with what a PRU is or what it does. Um, I'm not the best person to speak about them here. I think uh, we have our resident PRU expert uh, sitting in front of me. But just very quickly, it sort of allows you to do a high-speed real-time bit banging. You have uh, two separate or one or two separate uh, CPU cores inside uh, uh, like an AM335X or other TI ARM processors. A separate core with a very limited instruction set that you can use for doing basically such serialization, deserialization jobs. And then you exchange in the end memory buffers with the ARM cores on the Linux side. So you, you offload all your, your bit banging and your, your serialization, deserialization on this uh, PRU. And in the end, you have some memory buffers, uh, uh, DMA-like or memory mapped uh, that you use on, on, on the Linux side. And this would mean you could basically use, uh, the BeagleBone uses such a processor, so you could have a, a cape, actually, we could have an E1 cape for the BeagleBone um, that you just stack on it and um, you get uh, support for that. And the, the nice part is the BeagleBone could actually run the entire Osmo BSC and Osmo Media Gateway too uh, and use A over IP as a backhaul, so have a very nice self-contained small um, solution. You don't uh, need any, anything else uh, in, in that uh, approach. Um, my uh, uh, approach would be uh, to go for an XMOS device. Uh, I spoke a bit about XMOS controllers at uh, previous years. We've now done uh, our first uh, board design with an XMOS uh, in, at Sysmocom, uh, unrelated to this E1 uh, uh, idea. Um, and uh, XMOS uh, basically has uh, an interesting uh, architecture in which they have no hardware peripherals in the controller, so there's no I2C controller or no SPI controller and nothing like that, but you implement all of them as soft cores and you have a, a high-speed CPU core at a RISC core at 500 megahertz. Um, that has programmable serializers and deserializers and clock blocks around you, and basically you could do the serialization deserialization um, in those uh, in those uh, Serdes blocks, and then um, in the in the XMOS core you again uh, just do your your uh, basically collect a couple of those buffers and then send it over over USB or Ethernet. Both are available in in XMOS controllers. But then you would still need an external, uh, like an x86 or ARM board next to it, attached over USB or Ethernet, which then does the processing. So the, the beauty of the uh, PRU approach is the, on a BeagleBone that you really you have an all-in-one device and you don't have two devices in the end. Even though, well, the strictly speaking, of course, the CAPE and the BeagleBone are still two boards uh, uh, that work together. Well, of course, you can also go for programmable logic. But then it's not really software defined anymore, right? Um, depending on how you define software uh, uh, defined, and you need to work. And I think it's just overkill for a slow, for today's perspective, a two megabits per signal, uh, uh, two megabits per second signal. Uh, you can do that with big bit banging and and uh, and an XMOS or a PRU or something like that. Yeah. So. There's some uh, references if, if somebody wants to follow up on, on um, reading on this. Uh, what's the state of it? Well, originally we wanted to start this in uh, quarter one this year, but as you can realize, quarter one is over by now. Uh, it has not uh, materialized yet, but um, I think uh, we have to do it uh, soonish uh, because I think the window of opportunity for being useful to people closes. So now we have all this Ericsson equipment out there for little money. Now we still have people, particularly in, in less developed countries, who have an interest in deploying 2G networks. Um, and if we can have a... Uh, because so far the Osmocom stack has been used always with rather small cells or, or femtocells, right? Um, maybe up to 10 watt uh, uh, and, and single or 2 TRX. But with this equipment, we could really go for uh, 6 TRX, 8 TRX, 12 TRX, whatever large macro cells um, and um, uh, have a uh, sort of fill the gap in there uh, for a very low cost and, and help people. The gap filler, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a different, uh, yeah. Who who still remember remembers the gap filler in here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, they at least had boards. I'm just doing vaporware here. But uh, yeah, and that's uh, still so. So Tita and I want to look into this uh, soon and. Uh, implement it and the large part actually will not depend whether it's xmos or pru related because all of the software is just software 
in the end, uh, which controller or which hardware interface you use to get these raw bits uh, off the line into your memory, that's then a small detail. Um, and it, it's, it's actually the, the CRC4 processing, the, the TDM frame generation, the, the HTLC controllers and so on, that's all software anyway that you can run with any uh, hardware interface. Yeah, questions? Um, it's, um, they are, the, so, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, the question was, do I have a link to the uh, specs of E1? And my answer is, uh, no, I do not have a link right now. <laughs> but uh, I think it should be in, if you check maybe the Osmocom issue or so, I definitely looked at them, they are ITU specs. And I think it's, it might be something like G703 or something like that. I don't remember right now, but definitely uh, the, the entire, whether it's uh, E1 or E2 or E3 or T1 and all of these, they are all um, uh, uh, public uh, ITU specs that you can just look at. Um, let me just, uh, maybe I can find it here. Yeah, it's G703 mainly, I think. Um, so it starts with G702, but um, G703 is really the one. Uh, so basically here, this is the physical electric characteristics of hierarchical digital interfaces. Doesn't say E1 anywhere in the title. Um, but here actually, it, um, if you look at the, uh, here, you see there's the uh, 64 kilobits and then the, the T1, 1.5 megabits, and you have the higher bit rates, and then you have the E, uh, yeah, whatever, why they call it E12 here, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is basically the um, uh, this series of specs, uh, 702, 703 specs is uh, what you want to look at. It's not really not much. I mean, it's, it's a very little effort that you have to do. Uh, one, one aspect that I didn't mention yet, maybe it's worth mentioning, what you always want at the BTS, of course, is also a stable clock. So if we actually go ahead and building this, then I think uh, it would be worth to put a GPS DO on the same board so that the two megabit signal of the uh, E1 is really stable and then uh, you have no clock issues on your BTS as well. So um, yeah, maybe we can recycle some clock tamer there <laughs> if you're interested. Um, okay, so the comment was uh, they're doing a remake of the clock tamer, so um, okay. Um, Good. Any questions, comments? Yeah, Peter has a question. If somebody could pass the mic. Oh, Keith, behind you. Look behind you, a three-headed monkey. No. So how, how quick is the turnaround? How, how much time do you have for processing uh, of bits before you have to turn around? And uh, there is actually nothing really fast. I mean, I studied the specs and I couldn't actually find anything. Um, I mean, in the end, you have, of course, layer 2, lab D, which has some timing, but uh, those are on individual 64K slots, and so you have 30 other time slots that pass until you, you could respond, in theory, the first time, and the timeouts are rather in the 100 milliseconds or so, so it's clearly Buffering should not be a problem there, um, uh, at least not the kind of buffering you have on, on USB these days. Um. I like the, the PRU approach a lot. I think the PRU is, is fun. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I mean, I'm not emotionally attached to Xmas. I just think it's a good technical match for the problem as well. Um, but as I said, the software will be independent of that anyway. So in the end, we could have both or whatever. I mean, uh, we have to have the software implementation, and then I think the, the particular hardware interface will be uh, there's, there's many options. I mean, some people could even do it with an FTDI or something, maybe, uh, uh, if, if they wanted to. Okay. Good. Um, then if there's no more questions, that concludes uh, the software-defined E1 talk. <laughs>